Well, would you look at that? Bright sunshine. It's a Sunday afternoon down here in Devon in the southwest UK. And I'm just happy because we got warm weather finally. Um, yeah, so what it means is out here, excuse me, Jimmy, out here, uh, underneath, underneath this mighty sort of dark, tall, old barn type structure, we've got a lot of heat built up under that roof. So out here, it's bloody boiling. I'm going to do a bit of spraying in here today, my spare room, ready to go. Got birds up in the attic up there, I can hear, up in the loft. Um, but mostly what we've got on, we've got a few things on today. I'll take you a quick tour of what they are. I'll keep that door reasonably close so we keep it cool in here. But first thing, oh sorry, I wandered off on you there. First thing I've got to do is we're going to work on um, this beautiful old Ibanez. And it's, uh, I've forgotten the model number, it's probably in there. AM93ME. Um, Macassa Ebony, that's right, I, I called it Rosewood, because it was dark and brown. Uh, Macassa Ebony, but a lovely looking uh, thing, you'll no doubt agree. So what we're going to do with this is a full setup, um, not today, um, we're going to take care of some things first, and the first things we're going to take care of today are that, well, that try, we'll take care of that. Yeah, we've got some a ding there. Now, you can see it's a, a crushed finish ding. So it's a kind of, how do you deal with that? Um, do you dig it out, fill it with, you know, some fill and finish, um, hope it hardens up, or do you uh, fill it with some UV curable resin and do the same job? Don't know exactly. And then we've got another one here, which, um, oops, sorry, my aerials are getting bashed. This one here, which is uh, annoying because it's quite deep, but it's very feelable. So we're going to take care of that one um, and just fill it and get it back to flush. Then, obviously, a big old clean-up everywhere, um, followed by a setup using um, these uh, round-wound, flat-wound, oh, I can't remember what it says on the packet, flat or round-wound, I think it's probably round-wound strings, um, which has a, a lovely thubby sound that I guess is a, a jazz player's favourite, but it, it, when you play this it makes you want to do um, uh, Chuck Berry, because it's got that sort of flump, flumpy dead sound in the nicest possible way. Okay, so look, here's some, here's some people who use the site on a Sunday. This site, by the way, is a, I've said before, but it's a, it's a recycling plant, so I can do anything here as long as I want really, any time, day or night, without upsetting people. So what, what else I've got here is a couple of things that I'm getting lined up. My Fun Deek and Backer Fun 325 copy never got on with the bridge. Right, basically I chose, I bought a couple of sets of these bridges here and I used one for this guitar here, Trekkie 6, and I used one on this guitar here which I just didn't like either. So both of these guitars are going to get a uh, reversion to the old Chinese upward pointing bridge. Um, and I would just want to make that one playable for me. And I want to, this one, um, a customer wants this one, but I'm only, it's only for sale providing I like the bridge that I fit to it. And so we're going to start taking that apart today as well. My scrap wood pile, there's so much hardwood in there. It's nice bits of mahogany from a thousand years ago. Adam will recognise a piece of old construction that he donated to the cause. But there's loads of old panels. There's a bit of old mahogany left over here. Look at this stuff. And that was a side of a snooker table from some old pub. So there's all manner of good things about. There's bits of wood there. That's a piece of old pitch pine. Um, all kinds of goodies to be playing around with. There's another bit of pitch pine here, rescued from way back before. Look at the, look at the grain on that. R absolutely flat. No twist, nothing. Despite the grain going in that pattern, it's just completely inert. 
and uh, made a couple of good guitars that did. Okay, so this is, I'm going to try and get to sort of one, zoom into one, right. So the challenge with this is going to be what to do with these um, dings. Um, let me put the lights on. Because what I, well, this is, I mean, they're both crush injuries, right? They won't, they won't steam out. They're, they're you know, they're quite pronounced. Um, crushed finish which splinters the finish um, in some ways you kind of you've got a choice between um, digging out the, the shards I suppose you might call them the fragments and um, seeing what you've got at the end of it um, or you've got a choice to you know, either dig those bits out or leave them there and fill in around them I mean in one sense as I've said to um, Lucas, you know, th this is never going to be a, a complete, pretty, invisible repair because it's very difficult to just do that. Um, so what, what we're hoping for... Oh, look, you can see it right on the divide of the light. What we're hoping for is to minimise it as much as possible. And my, my feeling would be, hey, if we take out the bits... We've got more to fill. However, if we take out the bits, I think we may have a cleaner piece of underlying wood and we may be able to fill it easier with less visible damage. So that's my theory about this. And really, it is what it is, as they say in the most overused and somewhat meaningless of expressions. But it is what it is. Um, the bottom line is either which way we're going to fill it with some hardening material now i'm not turning putting on my my um thingy specs grumpy grumpy specs so we're going to fill it one way or another and the question is is um what what are we going to fill it with and how loose are these bits of leftover crunchy finish they're actually quite they're fairly stiffly embedded but they're sort of pushed into the finish as well i think um, so I'm just I'm just gently poking at some of them, get some of the bits out. <laughs> what I'm left with is the finish underneath, which is in quite clean shape. Um, <laughs> so I was sort of looking at this, thinking, well, if I get most of this out, then at least I can minimise the number of shards all pointing in the wrong directions, um, and then we can fill it. Hopefully we get a sort of clean, the way I described it was a swimming pool, um, filling a, imagine filling a pothole with glass, molten glass. At the end of it you've still got a pothole with ragged edges but it's filled with um, clear glass so you can see the edges but there, you know, it's, it's a little bit cleaned up. Now here's some bits here now that are split. So we're coming close to the edge, and the question is, do we pull out these split bits? Well, I think we do, since we're in that in that mode anyway. So I don't know how much you can see what I'm doing here. But this finish now is so brittle, it's now like little bits of glass breaking out. And that's actually a little cleaner than it was, to be honest. Um, I wish I had a microscopy type thing to get up close with these things. Uh, yeah, either which way. So while I'm doing this, I'm thinking, what are we going to fill with? Well, what we got is uh, we have some there we go, a little shard coming out there. We have some uh, UV curable resin which we can use. We've got quite a bit of that still to use up. Um, I think partly taking this stuff out as well is, is around the edges. It's better that we don't have cracked bits sitting around the edges waiting to come off. I can see this is um, this is some coloured... I don't know where it's gone now. There's some of these bits show that there's slightly 
sepia or amber colored finish that's gone on here as well as the color that's uh, on the wood so I don't think we have really much choice in that unless we're going to fill it with um, with poly instead of just doing it with resin and or glue boost I think there's a couple of types of stuff what really matters is whichever one we use that we've got a way of curing it quickly um, and with glue boost we have a accelerant and that's I think that's a tiny bit down to through the wood there's a little crack there that goes slightly down to reveal lighter wood so I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to find me some uh, some stain now where is my brown here it is rosewood is this rosewood yes rosewood I know it isn't rosewood but I'm getting me some rosewood just for the time being now I need a brush if I can find a small brush thank you now I need a small container so this one is is as much about just trying to um, limit the um, visibility of this thing now I'm wondering that's that rosewood is a bit dark for this there are some dark strands in there let's have a look how that appears yeah that's not too bad there's some dark dark strands but the majority of it isn't quite that dark so what we might want to do for the next bit is I think we might want some amber so let's get another little container temporarily and get some amber okay amber where art thou this is a slight problem I've got my grandpa glasses on so it's much harder to see things these are polishing compounds and not stains okay where are the stains there's a no that's not a stain either that's not a stain heh where are my stains well there's a cherry stain there but that's not what I want either oh no no we've got some water-based finish that's already stained but that's again not really what I want uh, okay this is a bit a bit weird there's there's amber poly uh, amber nitro sprays which we also don't want um, but my I really can't see with those glasses sorry about this somebody will write in and criticize so what the hell are you doing it's wasting my time looking for stains and things okay what's that that's resin 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 damnations all I can see right now is yeah I seem to have lost my old stains that's weird it's not very helpful either but I, it's, it's bizarre because I made ah here it is oh thank god for that I was going to say I mixed up some the other day it must be here here it is my amber stain sorry it's just one of those things let's get me a container I'll get there in the end. Sorry about that. A little bit of amber. Now it's much yellower than the uh, than the rosewood. Let's have a, have a look. Now what what I aim to do is just colour in the ground of this, the, the inside of this hole, so it's as innocuous or unnoticeable as possible it's not a bad set of colors the, the this water-based stain is just soaking up inside as well so it's probably just as well to kind of throw it on fairly thickly and then let it dry out so there's the there's the um, stain gone onto it okay. we could get a piece of tissue which I now have lost <laughs> oh, there it is it really is funny when you put on a pair of reading glasses how little you can make sense of anything else. OK, 
Okay, so I'm just going to soak up. It's not that bad, actually. Squinting at that, that actually works. Let's put my stain kit over here for a minute, out of the way, seeing as we won't use it. Okay, so now I've got a, a challenge, and I'll bring over the things that I'm going to choose between or possible options. I've got a thick, glutinous, ultraviolet cured resin, or I've got glue boost fill and finish, which makes a good, clear finish that you can scrape back and do all kinds of good things too. But then the same thing you can do with this um, this uh, yeah, resin. Um, the, the thing about the resin is it's, gl it's thicker and it might be actually harder to fill uh, and get. What I really want is some of this fill and finish glue to go in underneath these edge pieces where the cracking happens. Um, so the idea would be for that to sort of fill in. Um, now it's a quite a dry day, dry day here today. So I guess I want this to dry off as much as possible. Although um, this glue boost with the accelerant here. Oh, sorry, a bit of a zoom in. <laughs> We've got glue boost, fill and finish. We've got the glue boost accelerant, which is damnably expensive. But what it does is it's very quick obviously it sets incredibly quickly and if you can find your there's a there's you in the kit you can buy uh the, th the fill and finish which is what i've got there and you can also buy a thinner glue boost glue um, which i now typically can't find so i've only got the one consistency to work with um, you can use ordinary super glue on top of that it will work i'm just quickly looking around to see if there's any sign of the other fill and finish, the thin one, which is just called thin CA glue, funnily enough. It, I don't think they call it fill, fill and finish. Well, I can't see it. Um, so we effectively we've got the one to work with. But anyway, that's what I usually use. Um, and that, that allows you to um, fill in the crack and, um, and then spray the accelerant on which is kind to this finish, um, but will seal this quickly. Um, let's see which one's which one's been used. I think that one's been used. So I think for the viscosity issue, I think I'll use um, this one. Now what I'll do is, although it's not strictly necessary, I will put a boundary, a border around this. Um, typically, when you use this stuff, you end up if you do it really, really thoroughly, you end up sanding around the piece you're working on. Uh, you, you know, to, First of all, you have to scrape around with a blade which to get this down to flush with everything else. But then eventually, as you um, kind of fine tune it, you end up scraping and then sanding finer and finer and eventually getting to a point where you can um, buff it out. With this, obviously, I need to be able to get in with a with a blade, maybe a shorter blade, and we'll we'll get a brand new blade and we'll mask it off so that we can get in in there. Um, but it's a, it's quite a quite a tricky thing to do. But like I say, you, you often you end up um, you have to effectively expand the the repair area as you sand it a little bit further. You have to increase, and then finer sanding, you have to increase the area until you get to a level where you've sort of blended it in. It's nigh on impossible just to um, put some stuff on, job done, buff it out, because you you have to scrape it flat and then in, it'll always look uh, a bit like a repair. So what I'm going to do is, before anything else, I'm going to get a cocktail stick or two with a sharp point because I want to sort of guide this fill and finish into the edges of this crack. Crack? No, sorry. Let's not frighten Lucas. This, uh, whatever you call this blob thing. Now, glue is good stuff in that it will, it's very amenable to going into, wicking its way into areas. So I'm just 
sort of trying to guide it in everywhere and really be sure that it's in there. And now that's pretty much filled everything. Um, but obviously you'll see that we're pretty proud of the surface there. So here goes with the spray. Um, now the spray kind of, it looks messy to begin with, but the accelerant is very, it's very perfumed. So the accelerant sort of makes it pucker a little bit, but it what it does is it does finish it very cleanly, um, meaning that there you never get any bubbles in it. It looks bad from the top, but I don't know if you have it. Yeah, you can see it's all sort of dimpled up. But once we're confident that that's actually um, reacted off completely, um, we can then usually wipe away the finish like that, you see? And we've got a, we've got a little bit of a lighter area in the middle, which isn't actually too bad. It's, it's just the way the light's falling on it. But you see that we now got a. Um, I can actually wipe it clean with this, and you'll see how how harmless that spray is. So there we have, you know, pretty harmless finish. That's it's a little puckered um, on the surface, but that's not a problem in any way. So what what I would then do is find my way to where the blades are, get a new blade out. And these are usually a little bit oily, so be cautious about that. I've only taken two at once, but I probably need two anyway. So I'll put one on there, wipe the oil off, chop your finger off as I pick it up. Always the way. Now this, I don't have a lot of room, and this is also very slightly curved, so I'm going to break one of these in half to begin with. And I'm going to look to work inwards. Now, the slight problem with this is, let's take that off for a second. Uh, if I were to leave that there, it's in the way of my, my whatchamacallit, working. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this short piece, as sh probably as short as possible, and I'm going to cut some paper in two. And I'm going to, actually I need a, a sharp cut end. Everyone's crazy for a sharp cut end. I've got me, still got me grandpa glasses on. So I want a flat end. So what I'm going to do is make a, a sort of, make a square edge. Now I'll give myself a, a little bit of room. I'm going to fold it over on the blade like that. And then what I'll also do is cut off the excess bit here, which I don't need. So I've got me a... that, and then I'll do the same for the other half. And I want to leave a gap of about five millimeters between the green bits of tape. I should be able to do it like this. Well, maybe more than that, six or seven. Let's call it a bit more. Okay. So then I'll have, I'll show you in a second, I'll have a, a blade with a sort of exposed bit of blade in the centre and some green tape either side, like that. Now, in the Stumac instructions, what he tends to do is he tends to manage to burnish off a little edge of it um, so it's curled up, but I don't manage to do that very well, so I'm just going to work with the blade as it goes over the top of this repair. Now I can feel that it's, or well you can see, <laughs> taking off material there, you see? So that's scraping the top of our little repair. Um, it's also picked up some sticky goo, so let me just remove that so it doesn't confuse me. That doesn't help. So the good thing about this um, fill and finish stuff is that in the end, it ends up polishing out a bit like glass. It's very, very shiny and very, um, yeah, 
compliant, does what you want. Um, so you really, you know, you've got a sort of slow process of carefully scraping it back. And the the uh, beauty of the bits of tape on the blade is that they keep the blade just proud or just above the surface, so that you're um, you're not really scraping too much of the surface. And you're just taking the upstanding bits of the repair. Now, the, the problem of that, well, I might try something on this one. Um, if we can just get flush, I think with my buffer, it might be a good idea to just try buffing straight on top of this rather than sanding. The problem with sanding is I found time and time again is that, as I say, you end up quite significantly expanding the area that you're repairing on. You have to to keep it all um, keep it all sanded back eventually to the same amount as everything else. So, so it's a bit of a, a pain. Um, the 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 with with my buffer in the other room, it's probably likely that I can um, buff well, even when I've. Uh, scrape this out I could probably buff it from that point onwards to a shine because it's 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 very willing to be shined up so I probably don't need all those different grades of uh, sandpaper which is what basically causes the widening of the area because you know as you put one set of scratches on then you have to go a little bit wider with the next lighter gauge and so on and so forth so it's a, it's a bit of a expansion now what I've done here is I've widened the um, widen the blade area just so I can get the whole of this repair underneath the blade and a fresh blade as well. So if I can successfully flatten this repair out up to and including its edges where it joins the finish then as I say I may consider just buffing this out and see how well we can blend it in just with some buffing and avoid the whole sanding process. Very slow and satisfying process. As you can see, it's a bit like uh, good fellows chopping up the coke on the table. It's, it's very smooth um, already, um, but as, as I said, it's, we're working with a slightly curved surface, so we have to be careful not to um, overcut because it's curved and the blade isn't following it totally smoothly and as you lift your hands up you always get fingerprints in the way and stuff and hand stains and it always looks scary so I'm just very gently trying to smooth out the edge where it joins like I say if we get close enough then I think we could try the straight up buff out we could do some polishing with polishing cream first. All that all that sandpaper will do is get rid of these scrapes that the blade's putting on it and make it more amenable to polishing out to a glassy finish. Um, and of course, right now, you, as you can see, it has a has a grey look to it because it's um, it's scraped. But we're beginning to almost feel now it's almost almost smooth. See that? It's very, it's very smooth. Sorry about this. I'm just moving around in close up area. So I'm I'm trying to go sideways uh, on the least curved side. So just very very slowly, and you can feel and hear where it encounters a little bit of resistance and it's taking some material off. And so long as it's taking the material off the top of the repair, you, you sort of know that you've still got a little bit of um, material to go, but you can keep on very, very lightly doing it. And the more patience and the slower you do this, and the sharper your blade, and the more careful you are with your green tape, just giving the blade a little lift over the general surface so you don't end up cutting that too. The more you get more carefully you can do all of that, the, the smoother this thing will end up being. And the closer to just buffing out, um, 
have to say that's very very good the problem is you're going to technically you're going to get a little flat spot whereas i suppose you could say the actual body is slightly curved at this point because of the nature of the way the finish is applied to a curve um, and what we're obviously doing here is we're putting on a flatten flattening effect using the straight edge of this blade so we can't avoid that unless we had a crescent shaped blade which we don't have um, but I think we by coming at it from a couple of very careful different angles I think we can sort of minimize that that's very close now there's a little bit of over spill here that I know is on here but isn't necessary so I'm going to try and minimize it a little drip almost Now, what um, in the fill and finish how-to handbook, what they tend to do is at this point, they tend to get you to sand it in this area. Then they get you to put a little bit more, um, uh, a little bit of thin glue on to, to go into the, the, the finish. So we could do that. Go on, why don't we do that? Let's, let's do that. Let's take a little bit of... I don't want anything that heavy. Let's go for a bit of thousand grit, tiniest bit. So then what happens is people will say, well, how do you how do you keep the sanded area to a minimum? And there's a little trick that Dan Erlewine does. He does this, he puts his finger on there and he pulls the sandpaper past. Now I can see it's taking a little bit a little bit from the surrounding but it's okay we'll we'll be able to um what's some call it buff that out but where you put your finger focuses the sanding power of the paper and it feels really really smooth so there's a little bit on the edge here which i'll try and get rid of and you can see it's just just you can see on there yeah it's extended the um thing a little bit and if you you want to keep on being on the spot you can keep on keep on applying it in a spot way like that um, what you can do is you can um, you know if you're, you're really in the mood you can put a little tab of paper down like this and if you want to you can just go around it like this just to blend the edge and this is where um, you just slightly enlarge the whole area but it's a very small grit I mean we're talking thousand grit here okay so I'm just opening that I was going to just buff it and see but let's do it with we'll do it with a thousand and then we'll do it with 1500 here and you can do it with or without water whichever suits excuse me let's get a tiny tiny drop of water uh, let's take that out there put this in here now the um when it comes to the neck one it'll be i think a little bit of a different thing i think we'll well not too different but it will be a fill and finish blob in the side um and really that will be be a lot easier to finish because it's not such a, a critical surface mark like this one so you can see i'm now going with 1500 grit around the edge of the repair to blend it in now and then we take this off and you can see that obviously there's a little puff of repair now what i would then do is get my what do you call it this stuff uh that what's it called micro mesh and i would just now by hand go over the edges of this and round and round in a little circle That's 1500, and then just work my way, not that one, work my way through it. So everything at this point looks um, looks a little dusty until you buff it out. That's the main thing. But the idea here will be to reduce the grit as you go around. So you will find it going a little bit wider as, well as I go up through the grit. So 
So this ends up being beautifully smooth. That's the important bit. It's, it's very nice. So only a little bit each time really, just to take it higher and higher through the grit levels. A tiny bit of water to get it started. I mean, I can look at it now, it's not a trillion percent perfect, but you know what, it's a ton better than it was. Um, not at least, as on top of that, it's nice and smooth, so that's the main thing. Now, to obviously, to buff this out, I'm going to need to be taking off the hardware around this area. Um, and if I, if I um, buff it with the a small buffing wheel probably should get if I take this off I could probably get in there comfortably without taking the knob the pots out which would which would be nice because on a semi acoustic it's just a bit of a, a harassment now I'm going to start going lightly save the grain there's no grain on obviously on the finish but there's a grain on the wood so I'm just going to follow that a little bit I can see that it's somewhere in the midst of this. It's got, you can see a sort of a little bit of dry edge of the whatever the finish where it's crackled a little bit. But it's you know it's not that bad considering um, considering we're working with a, you know a pothole with ragged edges basically. Getting there. And we're up in the sort of four, six, I don't know, we nearly, what is this? We're getting close to the end. Can't keep track of where I am. 8,000, 6,000, 8,000, that's 12. So that's, oh, we don't, we're already at 12, okay. So that's the end of the micro mesh system. That's okay. We probably at this stage now find that we could put some polishing compound on there and before we know it um, that would be buffed out or polished out. Um, let's do that. Do you want, want my grumpy, grumpy glasses on? Okay, so here's a, a little taste of the buffing cream. Obviously it's not the same stuff that goes with the wheel but it's uh, you know, it's a polishing compound nonetheless if you do a few of these by hand you could probably do it by hand since I'm gonna do the surface of this guitar or the finish with this stuff anyway you could probably get it all all done and blended in this way take a few probably a few going overs goings over and you can see it's not a bad outcome. Yeah, a little bit of um, swirls. But generally speaking, that's nice and smooth. But as I say, we get that on the wheel and uh, give that some extra go. Um, the the, ch the challenge with any of these scratches is if you go back, let's say we go back through the thing, if you want to try and do it again, if you think there's a mark left in, let's go back to 1500, right? if we do it again we could try doing the 1500 all the way with the grain this time just to try and e ease out those couple of circular marks. Um, It's easy enough, you know, this is only a slow process with, um, get the right way around, it's just a, yeah, just a matter of slow going, 6,000, 12,000, 8,000, 12, 4, 6, give it the right way.
that's the, always the thing, you know, trying to blend in a repair is always difficult because, you know, obviously the area around it has not been repaired and has a always has a very slightly different look, um, which is very difficult to blend into. I think often when you think of doing repair, repairs, it's good to consider um, an area that you can blend into where you can make it meet up. Um, is there a natural boundary you can use where the, where the change, however slight, won't be noticed? Um, and that's often can be, oftentimes when you come across that situation, it will be the edge of a headstock, for example, where if you just confined it to a, a small area repair, you'll, you'll, you're in danger of always seeing the blend. Um, but if you, uh, if you go to the edges and, and just make the natural contour of the thing mark the boundary of your refinish, you can actually get a much more convincing result out of it. So using very light papers anyway, from 1500 upwards, or micro mesh papers, so there's, there's very little being removed. <laughs> Just keep on going till we get through to the finish at 12,000. So next after this I shall get on to the neck ding. And once that's done then really I will be ready tomorrow to do the, uh, the, the setup. Or I can start actually and just use the strings now to do the, um, the fret leveling. So let's see how far we get today. Yeah, so anyway, in terms of having a, a workable sort of boundary for this repair, it's obviously it's a big front part of the, the guitar. So in some ways, the wider your sanding goes, the less obtrusive, in a way, your repair gets because you're, you're blending out the change over a wider area. So it can be beneficial that way. On the ding on the edge of the neck, uh, it's much less visually noticeable, so you know, we can get that filled and leveled back smooth pretty easily and quickly without having to worry too much about the visual impact. Um, there we go. That's probably taken out the last little bits of swirl. But you can see the, the sort of patch has increased in size a little bit. That's okay. So now we could probably now polish this out fairly effectively. But like I say, we can always we can even take these out. We just have to hold them in place so they don't fall away into the um, body of the guitar, which for a semi-acoustic becomes a bit bit of a pain. I mean, the truth is you could get it pretty well done and dusted without going to the buffer. Um, just take a few more, a few rounds of doing this, really, until it blends in. But the buffer will definitely help um, clean it out. All right, well, I'll save the, save the rest now until we've... Um, got the hardware off and we can buffer it. But the next thing I want to do now is the second one. So I'll move things out of the way. What I really want now is uh, the amplifier to rest the guitar on. And in a minute, I'm going to put a pause after I've done this little fill put a pause on, sorry you won't be able to see for a minute so I'm just going to 
going to move you any second now. Um, we'll, we'll do a fill, and then we'll go out and do some spraying into other room. Where is the... There it is. Okay, so for this I will need the fill and finish. Now, if you're working with a smaller area, what I find useful is to put the fill and finish on a piece of card. Um, and then piece of card, and then bring it up in using the that thing, the sharp cocktail stick thing, and then fill fill the hole that way, and shoot it with the accelerant. That's quite, quite a big blob, so that will need to be carefully cut down, um, evidently. Okay, so I'm going to leave that to set um, and go out and do some spraying and come back to this in a minute. So what I'll do is I'll just stop the camera. From so here we are, second phase. Again, I'm going to go through <coughs> the very slight... Uh, gentle sanding process. You can see that um, this one's got a little bit of porosity in it, so it has it's, it's captured a little bit of uh, I don't know what dust in in the repair. Sometimes that happens, but you know it's smooth as anything. So I mean, you know, it's it's it maybe could have done with some color in there as well, but. It's not so important. This is this, I want this one to just be absolutely flawless in terms of the way it feels, and that's what I'm aiming for here. Gentle. Gentle sanding. Yeah, so I guess I'll, I'll have a look at the buffing it out business. I mean, not difficult to get to. It's not, if I use the small buffing wheel and just offer up the right bits carefully to the, to the wheel, then we don't have to kind of strip everything down to the ground, probably. Um, but we'll get a good go on the wheel. Okay, so there we have it. That's my um, very careful repairs. done with um, glue boost fill and finish okay that's interesting so that's put a little bit of put a little bit of porosity in there yeah. well what I might do is I actually at this point I might add in a little bit of um, tiny bit of High viscosity glue here. <laughs> of course, <laughs> like that, spoot gone everywhere. So I'll just wow, the temperature is amazing. It's making this stuff go up really quick. So let's go back a stage or two to the uh, 1500 grit. So the aim there was just to, um, the idea was to uh, just fill any little bits of porosity, you know, air holes that we had in the repair there. Now I just want to um, scrape the area flush again.
nice thing about a piece of tape like a piece of sandpaper like this is you can make it into a strip and then pull it across the finish so you get the curve the right curve out of it rather than you know risking imposing a curve on it you don't want you can follow the actual curve back to 1500 so again I'll follow the curve as much as possible to keep it smooth and then so after this I think I'll do the fret leveling part oh actually we'll do the nut change as well while we're at it Get the nut replaced with the custom adjustable. This has been, I was going to say it's been lacquered over, but I'm not sure it has. I think it just, it's a nice polished bone nut. So I think, I think it's uh, just a nice fit, nice and smooth. So we we'll, shouldn't have any problem removing that. Hmm. I think I need to let's see. This is the problem. The problem with if this has got a really thin finish, which this has, um, you can you can get when you're polishing out, you can just burn through a little bit. I don't know if you can see a tiny bit of burn through there. Um, so realistically, I'd want to build that up with some um, some poly, um, which I've got here. Uh, let's do it a bit into it and then sand back once we've built it up so that's a little bit more kerfuffle than I had planned on but that's the, that's the downside of making fills and sanding back so put a little bit of a little bit of poly there and then Do is we'll get a little bit of the old, tiny bit of the old amber. Not sure this is the not much left of this paintbrush actually. Yeah. Might even require a tiny bit darker. Let's go with a little bit of the rosewood colour. We've got amber poly right there in the oh it's mixed up already, so I'll just go on top with that. We'll just build that up a little bit. Use some little bit of dark rosewood colour on here. So I'll just um, I'll go off camera and do this, I think, because it will just take a little while. Just to build up a little bit of colour, then I will add some clear poly over the top of it, and then I will be able to sand that back a little bit. So we just preserve the colour on this little tiny bit here. So it's just a, it's just a little bit of painting job, and a little bit of building up. And there you are. It's got to dry. Mostly just wet, showing up as wet. But like I say, just need to build up that little spot a tiny bit more. Okay, save on tape. Um, I'm going to make a cup of tea, come back afterwards. Wow, well, it's uh, Bancoldi Monday.
oops, and we're here in the workshop ready to get this guitar set up and so that means in this part of the process this means leveling those there frets so I've, um, I've just lined it up and they're oh, they're in line these strings are so disgustingly filthy <laughs> that they have bits of goo crunchy goo coming off old crunchy goo anyway so here we are very light fret leveling there's not a lot of fret problems but this is just to ensure that this thing plays as low as we can make it um, and we'll also clean the frets as we go I should say sand and polish them out so <coughs> we've got some low frets right at the end here a low one there a low one there um, but otherwise it's not too bad and I'm going to Surprised if that actually doesn't snap. Just going to play these a little bit. Just hear each string. <coughs> Weather outside is currently very nice. I've spent a fair bit of today listening to audiobooks in the hammock. And you know, that's the bit about my lifestyle that I'm extremely grateful for or happy to have created, you know, the ability to, to do that during the day when it's nice weather. Maybe even some gardening things, you know, um, or, you know, recently it's been hospital things with Claire while she's been going through treatment, which is now mostly finished. But so I've had the, the luxury of being free to do that during the day. And in the evening, I've been able to come and do this. And it feels like a, a nice way, you know, I, you know, all those years of working in, um, corporate offices and stuff when the, as soon as the weather became beautiful you'd, you'd sort of look out longingly out the windows and feel a bit resentful but now I'm in charge of what I do and when which is very na nice but it's not it's not um sheer luck you know it's I guess it's how you make it when you know what's important to you how you want it to be Okay, so this will be yeah, a couple of very low ones right at the top. Um, and one in there. This will be um, the G, G track is usually the one where we see whether things choke out when we bend them. Um, oh God, these, these are heavy gauge strings. I can't get them that far. These are probably 12s, aren't they? Um, that's what... Lucas wants on these, so I, I haven't got a chance of bending them up, so I'm going to have to trust <laughs> that the levelling <coughs> has taken care of that. Um, any high points on the G track, but I don't know if Lucas has hands strong enough to bend that E a tone and a half or two tones at that point, because oh, I can't do it. Anyway, so. I'm just recalibrating between each track in order to make sure that this tool is mapping the curve as accurately as possible. And I think it's a very small amount of changes indeed. Um, don't know, it's hard to tell. This is quite an old or well played guitar, so it's hard to tell whether the frets have been leveled before. Um, I, I kind of have a feeling they have because these a couple of these are showing up as quite flat straight off the start line, which is which is unusual. It's not uh, usually that isn't what you're 
the leveling tool does to it, it, it reveals quite quickly that they're already somewhat flat from previous leveling. So with this, I'm just going to finish off the leveling. Then I'm going to do the crowning <coughs> and then I'm going to do the polishing out. Um, then I'm going to do uh, an overall clean and also uh, take off a little bit of the hardware, not too much of it, but enough so we can get a buffer or we'll get it up to the buffer and get it, um, get the repairs buffed up. Oh, jeez. Oh, there you go. <laughs> hmm. History. Very good. And there's a little tiny bit of difference now, but it's not so much as to be a major problem. So I'm just going to do this last one now. Obviously, we've reduced the tension on the neck a little bit. So, thanks to the round wound string snapping at that point. Shouldn't be too far off. Okay, so. Grime. Okay, I'm going to call this time to take the old strings off. Now, I, I've not really played with um, flat wound strings before, so I don't quite know how they break at the crimped part, which this one has, but I guess they don't have a lot of strength in that department. Um, but then again, these are massively old, or the, yeah, they look really old, so... It's not surprising that they just snap. Okay, so take all these strings off. Um, take a bit of the hardware off. Prepare it for buffing a little bit later. I've got a little bit of sanding to do on the edge uh, of the neck. There's a bit of broken string in here which we've got to pull out. There we go. Chuck all these away. They are history. <laughs> right. Goodbye. They feel they feel interesting. Um, it's like something else I've had before. I suppose it's a bit like one of those bracelets, the snaky type bracelets that have that really I suppose it's flat wound kind of feel to them. Um Right, so we've got a couple of little things here to do. Um, that's the fret leveling done, so let's put that out of the way. Now we're going to take off the nut and the truss rod cover. We'll truss rod cover first, and then the nut. Now this nut looks like it's uh, in good shape, should come straight off the end without any massive problems. Um, I think somebody, I, think I got a mega criticism from somebody the other day about taking nuts off, you know, and somebody said, it's perfectly good, you should have just cut the slots and called it quits. Um, speaking of a prize plastic nut with the crappiest of slots causing the guitar to go hugely out of tune so you just think to yourself you know, please don't comment when you don't really know what the hell's going on somebody also did one of those comments the other day where they said you should his opening statement you should flatten the neck out and level the frets that way that's how it's done and you sort of go, oh, oh gosh, yes, I, I must be only doing it this way because I don't have your superior knowledge and I, I evidently must have been misinformed, which is why I've been doing it this way for seven or eight years. You know, it's just, it's, it's the, the arrogance of people who cannot for one second conceive that you, you might be doing it all your way, the way you do it for a very good 
reason. It's just quite, it's quite incredible, really. Okay, so um, I'm going to take this nut off now. I'm going to give you an example. All right, this is this is the this is where we're at. Let me just um, clean up this mirror for a second, so I can look and see what's going on. Covered in rosewood dust. Right. right nut. 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 Who's talking to me? Don't know who that is. Okay, so quit looking at the, the nut. Now, if you see right down here, you'll see that the, that the nut is sitting on a shelf, but it's very tightly fitted to this finish here. Um, now, the only way you're going to get this nut out of here is to release it from its glue um, and that means rocking it or chipping it so it comes undone but there is a risk that it's going to chip something there now people might say well we must take another approach and I would say well what approach would you recommend okay if you put a little de uh, de detente mark in it and tap it out this way with a, a drift or a punch uh, chances are, if it's glued to anything there, it's going to take that with it. So, it's a bit of a, a no-win situation, or potentially a no-win situation. And I've been in this situation a lot of times. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to try and, first of all, free it up from its glue. Right? It's not wanting to go anywhere. Okay, so there's the, the move point. So we've got it going, and then up it comes. And it's not bad. It's taken a very small amount of wood from the um, slot with it. That's kind of to be expected. So what we have here is a, is a sort of, um, I used to call it vitreous plastic, but it's one of those solid plastic um, nuts, which are pretty horrible uh, and it will be making this thing not stay in tune so now that's off I can relax a bit with that now what I'm going to do is I'm going to recrown these frets and then um, once I've recrowned them I will then wipe the fingerboard so I can put masking tape on and get this masked off so I can polish out these frets to a shine going through a large number of gay grades of um paper okay so i want my little brush i need to get a couple more of these they're getting worn out brush for cleaning the teeth of my what's this thing called it's called a stew mac offset diamond crowning file so um, you can't see that now so i'm going to zoom out a bit so you can see what i'm doing so i can put it on one hey. so i'm going to take the tuners off and clean this whole headstock up as well as i go along and um, to make sure i can get everything nice and clean very little um, work being done at this point a um, little bit more on this fret so and this is where you get to see how much leveling work you did because the more you the more work you did the longer the fret now takes to round off again um, yeah. so so yeah bank holiday nothing nicer to do than some time relaxing in the hammock um, followed by coming up to the workshop and making guitars, working on them making guitars. So um, very luxurious to be able to do that. Um, I was very pleased yesterday with putting on, the, uh, I, I changed out the bridges on two guitars yesterday. Um, 
the one of them was the uh, Trekkie Six, and the other one was um, my Deaconbacker three two five Rickenbacker three two five headless tribute for you know fun guitar. I stress it was just an experiment to see if I could make something that paid paid homage to that fabulous iconic guitar. And I think I've made something that looks pretty good in terms of its iconic black and white penguin look. But um, I didn't like the bridge that I put on that and Trekkie 6. So both of those sort of got left a little bit. Um, and I was, I was basically working my way through a series of Chinese bridge parts for headless guitars. Um, and I'd hoped that the individual piece bridges were going to be useful pieces of kit. But actually, um, I found all of them to be uniformly crappy, really. Um, and this is mainly because they're designed with the idea that, well, they're designed with all of the tuner knobs sitting at the same exact same position level to each other and the idea is that somehow you are able to grab hold of these little things with no space between them to get your fingers in and somehow you can turn them and, and get the guitar in tune which of course they know you can't do which is why the, um, the guitar is built with or comes with built into the side of the um, bridge unit is this little crank handle which is actually quite good for I and mean, it's very effective for changing the strings um, but it's a little bit, you know, it's an admission that um, you can't do this thing with your bare hands. So, um, but that aside for a minute, what yesterday reminded me was just how good the original bridge that I've used f multiple times now, um, which doesn't arrange all the pieces at the back like the individual ones do. Um, this this positions them upwards <coughs> so the idea is you can bring a tuning knob to them and it's the tuning knob that then makes the one you're working on <coughs> accessible you you don't have to sort of get your fingers in between because the tuning knob is the extension and it slots into a little hex thing and it and if you make a tuning knob that's magnetic which I usually do then it goes in there and holds on pretty well as well. So um, having put that bridge on both these guitars, I'm really thrilled that I spent the most of the evening last night. Ah, birds in the attic. Spent most of the evening playing the, um, the Deacon Backer, which I really loved. I rediscovered how much I liked it now. Well, I didn't really discover. I, I discovered how much I liked it, um, and the um, the Trekkie Six, which um, I'm really exploring uh, because Beach wants to buy it, and I basically said, um, you know, I'm not going to sell this unless I'm absolutely certain that I like how it plays and I'm happy with it. So I'm uh, putting this new um, new bridge on it. Um, I got a chance to play it yesterday and I was also thrilled with how that plays as well. So that was a and the neck. It's an Ibanez wizard neck <coughs> and it works really well. So I'm, I'm, I'm encouraged now with that new bridge. I'm encouraged that the guitar Tracky 6 will actually be a really good guitar. There's quite a few little things to do to it. It's tripped me up still to do, um, but that's okay. That's just a matter of uh, some time. So I'm looking forward to doing that um, and ending up with a, a really nice playing guitar that almost wasn't going to see the light of day. Now, what I've got here is my adjustable tusk nut. And I'm just going to check it out for size. Well, look at that. That is, I would say that is almost, apart from a little bit wide, um, needing thin, thinning down at the back, that's pretty much going to go drop in nicely there. 
uh, and would make it stand up on its little feet to go into um, position. So to get this bit right, I'm going to put this back and I'm going to get me the sanding block. I need to get some more need to get some more uh, that special tape that I use the double sided duct tape because <coughs> that's going to that's really vital for making new sanding blocks and changing the stuff on the sanding blocks I have to do that every now and then okay so the the first thing with this is to my sleeves out of the way First thing is to get a flat surface on the front edge and we've got a bit of width we can wear away now to, to achieve this flat surface so I'll just concentrate on that for a minute and then we've got that flat surface um, we can then work on the back part to line it up so there's a little bit of fair not fair it's about a, possibly up to a millimeters of difference there so there's a a little overhang here on this back edge so we'll kind of take that off first and then we'll get ready to take down the back edge a little bit as well which looks all right so basically at this point it's a matter of um, taking it down to a flush finish on all sides and one that just fits perfectly into this gap. We don't want to um, cut any of this, so it, it is just a matter of thinning the. Um, where's the nut gone? Let's get the nut back. It's a matter of thinning the this one down before we put it back in. Um, what did I do with the original nut? Anybody? Okay, there it is. So we can we can see from just placing it, try or positioning it, but if we, we want to be absolutely sure we can check out the check out the width of this and we'll see that it's 494 and currently this will be about five something 590 well it's nearly a, it's a millimeter too much okay so this is going to require some distance taking off the back but there's no harm in that as long as we keep it flat um, we can take a fair bit off there so I'm going to use a fairly rough gauge um, and the main thing about this is to take the material off in a consistent way so that we end up with uh, a nut that's the right thickness but doesn't sort of get fatter at the top okay so we, we say 490 we wanted so we're working off the back edge remember So it's going to take some of the tusk uh, insert material away as we do this. That's to be expected. Um, the 3D nut, the base part, is softer, I think, than the uh, than the tusk unit. So it's, it doesn't cut quite the same way. 572, 566. So again, just a slow process of working it down to fit and like I said we want to make sure there's a, uh, a perpendicular front edge to this nut so th this week I've got um, I've got a lot on as of kind of now onwards but so what I'm going to do is I'm going to be um, I'm going to be Wednesday, I'm going to be heading towards Swindon to take Andy Partridge back his three guitars. Um, um, tiny bit of checking to do. Um, I've got to put the truss rod cover back on the uh, on the Epiphone Broadway, but um, and then I'm going to just lightly wire wool the repair area in front of the headstock on the Harley Benton um, and then when, when we when I get back up there and uh, Andy tries out the guitar and sees how he finds it then we'll make a decision about if 
he wants any other kind of finish on that um, headstock front. Um, you know, the issue has always been if you if you do a partial repair on something, the blending part is the very difficult thing to do, um, and it depends on how it looks and how you feel about it. But um, you know, if Andy wants, I can. Uh, I can instead of trying to blend and repair, which I've done so far, I could then just sand, uh, just um, spray the whole front of the headstock to a contained, delineated area with um, matte uh, poly, and then we'll call that quits. So if that's the case, I would. Um, it depends. We'll potentially bring it back down and do it. Um, it's a it's a bit difficult to, uh, you know. I, I think I mentioned this somewhere before, but um, it's one of those things that can make a customer suddenly be very nervous if you know it's not in their sort of re scope of experience that taking a nut o off can result in some finish damage you know if they don't know that it can seem quite a big deal uh, to the blue so I think um, I think when he sees it oh, this has pulled a strip off this one that's interesting um, yeah w when he sees it I think he'll he plays it I think he'll probably feel how good it is and and you know, won't really see much of the blend area um, because it is very, very minor. Anyway, so this is um, this is pulled out a little bit of the one of the strips of the three D printer, but it's not really a, a problem. I mean, it's not it's not relevant for this. So um, I think what I've probably done is I've probably taken more off this. Um, back side than I normally would do so I'm going to st now stick to the front edge of the nut if I'm going to take any more away from there so I'm just really working this down to the exact thickness I could do with some clean sandpaper I really could <laughs> Yeah, so um, up to uh, Swindon. Um, maybe, depending on how it goes, may pick up some more guitars of Andy's. Um, um, and then I'm going to go on up to my mum's place in Barnet to drop in on her. I haven't seen her for quite some time in all this pandemic. Stuff. So, but since I'll be kind of half the way there on a long journey, I figured I would just carry on going. Spend a couple of evenings up there, or a couple of nights up there, and then come back. So this is quite a narrow um, nut, so having to work it a fair bit to get it down into that existing slot. And like I say, I really don't want to um, I don't want to open up that slot any further. Yeah, almost there. Yeah, so that's next week lined up. Um, and then JT is uh, coming down on the Saturday, I think, with a couple of guitars. One of them is um, one he bought from me recently. And <laughs> just by pure chance, bad luck, you could call it, the, um, the neck has twisted. Um, so. I'm currently, oops, that's pulled out another bit. I see, that's, that's okay. 
Um, yeah, so I'm, I'm currently making him a replacement neck. Um, once in every 20 or so necks um, from the Chinese manufacturers, I get a dud one, but it's not that often, really. It's a, it's a pretty good um, success rate, I would say. Um, okay, that's interesting. So it's pulling um, little strips of the of the printer material out as I'm doing this, but it's okay. We need to shave it down, so it has to do that. Get it. That's just about to fit in now. You can see it's almost there. So, yeah. So um, that replacement neck is being sprayed as we speak in the other room. This is why I will take a moment out. I'm almost in the slot, so it's very tight or very snug fitting. Um, which is what we want really. We don't want it too loose and we don't want it, um, we certainly don't want to, we don't want it too tight so that it ends up breaking the, um, there's any damage to the uh, stuff, the lacquer. We don't push it in and have it snap anything. So it's, it's, a, it's a matter of you know, taking it down slowly, steadily until we get to the correct thickness. On top of that, then I will um, I'll make sure to uh, just sand out the bottom of these feet so that when it pushes into the, uh, that's pretty much almost there. So you can see, it, see, you can see it's a thin, <laughs> it's a thinner than normal nut, but that's just how it is. Um, it's a vintage Ibanez, so it's not your kind of run of the mill Les Paul nut shoved on the end there. Okay, so I'm just smoothing that off. That's nice. That sits in perfectly. Yep, okay. So what I'll do, I don't know how well you can see that, but now I'm going to push out the nut. And now what I want to do at this point is free it up from the base. And I'm going to just stick the, uh, the little grub screws out just a little bit. And then while they're sticking out, I want to flatten them back very carefully to a level. So we have a flat, a flatter foot as possible to sit on the um, base, which is pretty thin now for this kind of guitar, so not a lot of material, so the, the more this spreads its footprint, the better. Okay, so that's fine. <laughs> okay, let's see, okay, frontwards, frontwards. So there we are, there's our reshaped nut, and when we put it, oops, when we put it in here, it will start out sitting too low, but the idea then will be that we bring up the, uh, bring up the adjustable nut, um, like so, to raise up the action. This one's quite stiff down here, so. So it'll start off something like that. That may, if, it, if it's not tall enough, we'll get another one of the taller ones because um, it may require a bit more, but we'll hold off for a minute. Put it there, put it there. Okay, so that's possibly the nut done. Um, now this one, this repair on the front is waiting to be buffed. Um, and to make that work, I'll probably, it would, may, I was going to say, it may make sense to take the 
uh, knobs off but I'm not entirely sure how willing they are to come off so if I can work round it I think I will um, okay so the, uh, the other little bit here is I've got a tiny bit of sanding to do on the edge here um, this is very tricky because basically it's a very thin coating of finish um, it's, it's just so easy to go through and end up you know, cutting through the finish. There's no, you can't guess, you, do, I mean, you can't know how much you're taking off. So, so I start out with a 1500 grit, a little bit of water, and I just basically and then stop. <laughs> now you know, it's just being as careful as possible. more so I'm really just trying to uh, smooth out the um, any sticking up bits of finish and trying to go as lightly as possible using as little abrasives as small a grit as possible just to end up with a very smooth finish but you know having taken a small an amount of the finish and I think we might get there. Um, I know that the wipe on poly that I used kind of went you know off to the side of the repair so I'm, that's why I'm sort of working all around it. The main thing about this was um, was to make sure that this um, was couldn't feel this, it didn't interrupt playing with that sort of dent feel that it had before. So that's the sort of main objective. And if I can get that, then I'm happy. So I'm, I'm moving very quickly to the next grade or gauge of stuff, I'm hardly spending any time on there at all. This is actually a new set of micromesh that was sitting in my glue boost repair uh, pot and it got used once for a bit of repair and then left there. But I could could have used it. Look, unused, blimey. Lovely and fresh. As 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 um, smoothed out as possible, really. We're down at twelve thousand grit. Don't really get much finer than that. Well, certainly not in the micro mesh scheme of things. Okay, so from here onwards, it really is just down to the buffer. And like I say, the main the main thing is to end up with something that feels beautifully smooth and you can't tell anymore your thumb doesn't feel it which is good okay now this I'll put off to one side I want this to dry but it's not going to dry just yet sorry about this be there in a minute yeah so <coughs> Yes, got lots of interesting things on. Get this done for Lucas today. A bit of duck. Well, I've got to I've got tomorrow to finish it off as well, if necessary. But I, I want I prefer to have it done today. Um, okay. So what I'm going to do? Oh no, it's disjointed. I never finish a sentence. I'm going to take off the tuners now because as I go to a, <coughs> a buffer. Um, now I can at least clean all of this up at the same time. And taking the taking the uh, tuners off is a, always a good way to allow you to clean the headstock. Um, otherwise, it's 
it's pretty difficult to get in and around the tune as it never really works out. I don't know what the view is here. Oh yeah, you can sort of see. Jolly good. Um, yeah, so lots of interesting things. Um, as I say, possibly, hopefully some more of uh, Andy's guitars. If, that, if he's happy with um, the way the, I've made them play. Um, I've got some uh, JT bringing a couple. One for the new neck, one for or first of a number for fitting a, a preamp into. And we're trying out a preamp made by a Polish chap. Um, the first one didn't seem to work. Now, uh, I'm not really sure whether it was how much it was to do with his machinery, his, his uh, electronics, um, or his pretty poor instructions. Um, so that caused me a bit of trouble. Um, and I think I've said before, he was very willing to help and sent me a replacement one in case this first one was faulty. So I've got the, the second one here, and that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to try off camera to do a simple I put it in inverted commas, a simple test. Um, but the problem with doing a simple test with um, something like this uh, preamp is uh, it's sort of, I don't quite understand why, but it, was, it appears to be designed to just, um, well, it switches on when you, it's designed to be switched on by the jack, um, which sort of suggests that it's designed to be just on full stop you know so <laughs> you don't have a you don't have a by it wasn't intended with a bypass but so um, in order to test it I need to set it up with a bypass so I can switch it and hear it come on and off and de determine whether it's actually working or not um, I have a feeling I might have to go for the taller foot on this. Um, taller base, possibly. Hmm. Let's get one out just in case. It's a, a bit of a pain because there's more. Oh, hang on a minute. Maybe it's one of these taller ones. There are so many of them. Now I'm sort of lost track of it because there are some of different heights and there are some all the same. I think these are all the standard height ones. I think this might be a tall one. Nope, that's a flat one. <coughs> yes. Anyway, so yes, there's. Um, couple of uh, the uh, project to get this preamp working and fitted into JT's guitar. Um, then there's uh, yeah, it might be a better height. We'll keep that one out just in case. Um, and then what else is there? Uh, well, I've got a couple of acoustic guitars for um, somebody local to here. I've got um, I've got uh, some guitars coming the end of the month um, and an interesting complex wiring job for uh, Nelson possibly uh, towards the end of the month as well so um, some interesting challenges okay so um, hmm. I guess the problem with redoing this is that I would have to once again sand it down which is going to make it pretty thin. In fact, it's, it's yeah, it is very thin. Uh, I mean, you could always put a, a shoe under it um, to lift it up, but it's kind of, I, I was hoping not to do that. Let me just see what the sort of limits to how tall this will stand, and we'll get an idea what's feasible. It can stand quite high up without falling out, doing anything it shouldn't do. Let's have a look. Yeah. 
here. I think you might need either a, a foot on it. I think in a way a, a foot would be a better thing just simply because this is already very thin um, and I don't want to spend hours cu cutting another one down when actually I could I could um, glue a piece to it like that and just wear it away. Now what have we got? What are those creatures? Birds, I tell thee. Right, okay, well, tell you what, I'm going to do that off camera because it's boring. Um, well, I'll also do the sanding and polishing off camera too, so I'm going to tape this off because this is ready to be polished out. So, kind of long winded but useful process of taping this off to sand it out with the various grades of sandpaper. And then once I've done that, I'll take it to the buffer and give it uh, going over in the repair area so we get them to a nice um, shiny finish. And then we will put everything back on and get ready to fit new strings. All right, so see you in a bit. Probably, uh, probably heading, see me heading for the, um, bits of chopped off fret. See you heading for the buffer, buffing wheel, which isn't set up, but it doesn't take five minutes to do. All right, we're back in from the spraying room. Ha, ah, and here we are. Buffed out, nut on, slightly boosted nut. Um, tuners off, headstock buffed, body buffed down by the land of the repair. You'd hardly tell, and that nice and smooth down there, although you can see it still, but you know, it was nothing compared to what it was. You know what I mean? You, you can't have everything. Right, now, how is that possible? There's the third one I was gonna say. How can you lose a tiny screw? Yeah. Right, we are. <coughs> okay, so, I'm going to put on, put on the trust rod cover, the dance blues, and then I'm going to, um, what we're going to do is we're going to put the hardware back on. I haven't cleaned the hardware up because this would look a bit odd if we polished it out, right? Now, there are some guitars where it would look brilliant to do that, um, but on this one, it's got, it's got age and patina about it. It has some style and substance, so I don't want to do that. So I left it kind of a bit original, a bit like it was. Okay, so we have the bridge post. Now this bridge is, the intonation on this is, I have to say, is a bit all over the place, so I really don't know what's happened here. Again, I'm not going to overly clean this up, but I think I do want to make, uh, if I can find it, uh, let's, let's see if we can, right, so these are facing opposite directions. Ahem. Technically speaking, God, this is stiff. Oh my way! Shortest would be the. God, this is stiff. Shortest would be the. Oh man, this really is hard work. Hmm. I think this probably to do with some oil somewhere in it. Okay, so that would come forward from there. <coughs> Excuse me. I'll go back from there. And now we go back. Now we've got, a, what is it, a wound 
G <coughs> work in this whole setup. So the WAM G will come forward, which is probably about, thankfully, I think that uh, saddle will probably be in about the best place it could be. We might just get enough room on that. Right, start with that. Okay, so we're nearly there. So we have repaired the dings. We have fret leveled and polished out. I haven't put any uh, oil on here. I'll do that now. A little bit of oil. Um, yeah, and uh, next thing it's strings on. We're ready. Now I've not played with um, these flat wound strings before so I don't know how they take to stretching out but I think what I'm going to do is I'm not going to give it a massive stretching out. I'll demonstrate how I do it but I'm going to just back off partly because I don't have any replacements if these are more or less likely to break than other types. I don't know but that it broke a bit earlier on, so you never know. Anyway, uh, so I will just demonstrate how one would ideally stretch this out. Um, and then go from there. And you can do it in your own time. Okay. A 12. Plain steel 12. No wonder I couldn't bend that. Okay, nice. Gold coloured. Beautiful. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's first of all line up the holes and the posts. So we can get the strings through a bit easier. So after this, oops, oil finger. After this, I'm going to sit down quietly at the wiring department and I think I've got to uh, ah right um, let's not do this when you're sorry it's pretty hot in here now um, when you're when you're you've got an adjustable nut I recommend you put the G and the D on first so I'm just gonna hook in the D and the G and we'll put them on and they will hold Oh, isn't that beautiful string? God, oh, that's lovely. That is a wound string, but it's such a nice feel to it. <laughs> Gorgeous. Okay, so let's let's drop this. Put this G in. Now, the reason for this is that G, the G now will hold the string in, pl uh, hold the nut in place, so it doesn't go pinging anywhere. So I pull back a fret's worth. And then wind on holding a string, bring it over the loose string to begin with, round, and then directing it under the loose string as the loose string comes round again. And that makes a little sort of locking device. There we are. And that of course went between the saddles, thank you. So that's the that's the um G. I'll put the A next just to keep it down. Oh wow, so the A is silver chrome grey. Not A, sorry, the D. <laughs> you know what I mean. Okay. Again. Back a fret's worth. Hold it. Loose one under held one round it comes held one under the loose one so this is looks about right the strings are sitting on the um, on, uh, first fret so it's just about where we want our nut to sit as default so even with that little extra lift uh, thing it's just about right it would have been too short without it Okay, so all the way through, 
back a fret, go over, under. Fifty. That's pretty chunky. There's a beautiful feel to it. Actually, this isn't. Oh right. This, so this is what's called round wound, is it? Oh, these are round wound. Okay. So they're slightly different from the flat. I think it was flat wounds on before. Am I right? Lucas will know, but I can't remember. Not very. I don't have much experience with them, so I can't tell the difference. Over, second time, under. Put it up on the saddle, there we go. And now for the B and the E. Under you go, please, thank you. Hold it down, wind it round, lift it over the loose string and then push it under the loose string. Yeah, w a weird thing last night, for some reason I didn't sleep and there was no, nothing, I'm not worried about anything, uh, any of that kind of stuff, just for some reason didn't want to sleep, so I haven't actually slept today, so I'm kind of in that slightly spaced out way you used to, used to get when you were a youngster and would go to a, an all-nighter or something in a club. Come out gritty gritty eyed the next day. It was nice seeing the sunshine come up, or sunshine come out this morning. Okay, dokey, everything looks good. All right, let's clip off the unwanted excess first. So when you can't quite reach it, move it out of the way so you can. Nothing worse than accidentally snipping off the string that you want to play because you didn't move it out of the way of any others. And I've done that before. I felt very stupid having done it. Okay, there's the lovely round wound round wound strings okay so the first thing I'm going to do is raise this up to get approximate but playing action that I want both ends. Now that's the strings hitting the, uh, the first fret. So now we're going to raise up the bridge action slightly. Bridge nut ourselves a bit of clearance at the nut. There we go. Just to start with and then we'll get a tuning fork.
These um, saddles on these tunematic bridges are just rubbish. Um, they they would kind of they would give you the idea that they should be the other way round, but they shouldn't be. That's the correct way round because they are slightly different sized notches, but. but they don't seat over there very well at all. Um, I would, especially that G, that's sitting up quite high. Oh, I hate it. <laughs> do I hate it or do I hate it? So as I say, I'm not going to stretch these too far. Well, there we have it. Just do a little quick check on the action. We have 1.5, 1.2, it's pretty low. Except for that ghastly G saddle, I would, I would, I know it's a, well it's not that, oh, it's not that different a bridge, I would be looking for a different bridge there for this. Um, failing that, uh, making an alteration to the G saddle, sinking these, sinking a little bit lower. Um, in fact, that the, this half comes up in a reasonable radius. In fact, I think what we've got here is that the, the um, in fact, realistically, I think the D and the A are low, if anything. Uh, so I would suggest probably a, a replacement um, saddle for this. It's just, it's a shame. I mean, it's it's a it's a it's not that old a type. I mean, it, it is. It's it's particular to the Ibanez um, model, but it's pretty tunematic-y. So if you see the, I'm trying to show you the top three strings, and look how low the next two sit by comparison as you sink down. So the G is sticking up way high still, um, and that the G, the B, and the E are sort of going up. They should be going upwards in a radius. What you see is the D and the A are probably quite a bit too low. Um, and that's really due to, hey, don't even bother going, zooming in or staying in focus. Yeah, you know, that's, um, that's a, that's a problem with the piece of hardware. I think, you know, maybe it's worth replacing and failing that, um, you could 
no you couldn't really I was gonna say you could cut the other ones lower but then you're just sort of going you're dragging the others down to a low point lowest common denominator and then realistically they would be um, out of uh, sync now um, there's one more thing I'm going to do on this and I, let, I kind of left it to this point because it's really just a physical thing it's to adjust the or to replace the, this jack socket with uh, a, a, what do you call it hmm. a square socket um, but I'll come to that in a minute let's just look at this intonation business first the problem with this again is we can't really get a very good reach on this Pretty much close. Now, this is a question is that? Is that a wound string? Do you know what? It is wound, isn't it? That's why. I thought it was. Sorry, it's not wound. It's uh, it's plain. I thought it was wound. So that's now in the wrong place, which is why it's too sharp. Let's see if we can work its way backwards. Oh my lordy, does it want to go? Um, in case you've ever heard me talk about these before. I absolutely can't stand tunomatic bridges, particularly old stiff ones like this. So that confused me. I thought that was a very fine wound G, but it's not. It's a it's a plain G. So that means this one needs to go backwards of B. And that's about far back as it wants to go. It's so stiff, it's not good at all. So, these damn things, okay, well these are too, too long, but I can't get them to go any further this way because they're, I can't get this one, this one would have to come out and turn around. So this is what I hate doing, but thanks to the Tunomatic Bridge, which I hate, I have to do this. So it's, Nothing you can really do about it. Nothing you can do about it. I hate tunomatic bridges. Uh, in terms of the the pattern on this, honestly, this would be a smart thing to do to replace this thing. I wonder if I've got one that's even worth replacing that's better than this piece of crap. Gold Tom Bridges, anybody? Anybody got a gold Tom Bridge? Probably. Epiphone. Hmm. No, that's a different type. Or maybe. Well. Hmm. 
Well, okay, so what we've got here, the first one, we've got this our stupido one that we have to now take off somehow and reverse it. Oh, not that's great. Now comes the washer, knackered. Uh, so these aren't really. They clearly don't like doing this, but they have to do this because we can't intimate them otherwise. So I've had to change this one round. Now we're going to try and get the um, get the what's it back on it circlip thing. But to be honest, the circlip's bent. Because it doesn't, you can't get it off any other way. We may just have to live without it. I'll try and push it on, but it's a, it's just a, a hideous design thing. Made by monsters. I mean, that's a, that's a completely sort of partly mangled circlip sort of bend it back into play. Try and fit it back on here. Well, just about. Okay, so now we are coming forward of this. That was too too long, wasn't it? So we'd come forward of this quite a bit. And then bring this one forward a bit too. And this one forward a bit. So here we have the original, and here we have a copy. Well, you know, um, this one I suspect will. Um, this one is probably likely to have a better radius on it, so I might just try it and see. And frankly, it's one of those things you can have. Um, one of the things that I was looking at the, um, the various ways of reinforcing this, um, this uh, jack socket thing hole. Um, and it's a slightly problematic because it's a little hole and we can't really get in it very easily. Um, so maybe we just have to go in with four screws into the thin wood which isn't the best thing in the world, but we may just have to do that. Okay, now this one also really wants to turn around too. So we have to do the same here. Hey, can we lift up that? No, can we? Heck. Oh boy. I hate pneumatic bridges did I tell you how much I do the reason I'm switching these over is just because there's nothing worse than this thing being out of sync with the shape being wrong it's just crap so I'm gonna see if this one does the job for the time being and quite quite frankly you can have this for peanuts okay Oh god, I hate pneumatic bridges. I bloody well hate them. Forward, come on. Forward. Forward, thank you. Forward. Thank you. Forward some more. God, I hate pneumatic bridges. Let me tell you how much. Can I tell you how much I do? Hey, we'll try and hold this whole little thing in place by a spindly little gold wire, which isn't going to want to go in, or if it does go in, it's going to want to lift all of these little screws out of the way. <laughs> uh. 
Uh, get in there, something like that. Ay, ay, ay. <laughs> yeah, so um, um, yeah, I'm not really convinced that we can do much of a mega repair to that. Let's, have a, let's just have a look at how this runs up, what kind of shape, relief shape we get. G, as always, the G is slightly wrong. I can't stand these things. Right, since this is a replacement, I'm going to do what has to be done here. They are just such a garbage design. Yeah, I mean, what, what crap that you should be doing this. One should be doing this. <laughs> right, bit of sandpaper. Yeah, you shouldn't have to be doing this nonsense. compared to where, where it was before. which is probably too low at the moment. Uh, 1.25 under 1, so I need to raise it. Now it needs a tiny lift here, and here, here, and here.
that is about right. I still think a, n a nice new long travel roller bridge would be worth it on this thing. Okay, that's that bit done. Um, I'm going to switch off now and I'll take care of it. Well, I'm going to look and see whether I've, make sure I've got a, a jack plate that I can do here. I've got tons of sockets, but we'll have a look. Anyway, that's it for now. I need to um, get a drink and uh, we'll send that back. That, that's just the height the, or the um, radius of that is terrible compared to this, which is actually a lot better now than the other one. Um, I just think it makes it a better guitar to play. This is diabolical. Anyway, all right, thanks for watching.